the vice chair of the Financial Stability Board and chair of the FSB Standing Committee of the Assessment of Vulnerabilities. He's going to be speaking to us today about financial system risk, uh, but also the Eurozone economy. Um, he's a member of the Governing Council and the General Council of the European Central Bank. He's a member of the European Systemic Risk Board, a member of the IMF's Board of Governors, and a member of the Board of Directors, the BIS. Um, Klaus holds several secondary positions, including, among others, um, Chair of the Supervisory Board of the Clinic Clowns Foundation. Uh, since 2005, he's been a Professor of Economics of Central Banking at the University of Groningen, his alma mater, and since 2015 has been a professor of monetary stability and economics um, at the University of Amsterdam. He's published widely in a variety of articles and journals um, in prominent Dutch and international journals on the field of monetary and financial economics. Uh, before joining uh, the, the Dutch Central Bank, um, President Connaught was at the Dutch Ministry of Finance. He worked at the IMF and was in the former Pensions and Insurance Supervisory Authority of the Netherlands. Um, I'm pleased today to hand this over to President Kanat. We will be taking questions and answers, so please use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Others will not be able to see your questions and they will remain anonymous, but we'll have a moderated Q&A session after uh, President Kanat's remarks today. So thank you so much, uh, Susan, uh, and it is indeed uh, a great honor for me to speak at this uh, international symposium of the National Association for Business Economics. I guess uh, what we all share is a fascination for uh, economics here, and having worked myself in, uh, in academia uh, at the Ministry of Finance, at the International Monetary Fund, uh, and at the, at the Central Bank, I think it's fair to say that I live and breathe uh, economics, and I hope and trust that this is the case for, uh, for many of you. So I feel very much at home here. But uh, talking to a predominantly uh, US audience, I thought it would be good to start with a quote that hopefully will resonate as much with you as it did originally uh, with me. And the quote is as follows. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking." End of quote. So began on March the 12th, 1933, the first of about 30 fire set ch uh, chats that President Roosevelt delivered over the radio. And it was eight days after his inauguration, he had spent the first week coping with an epidemic of bank closures that affected households in every state. Three days after closing down the entire American banking system, Congress passed the Emergency Banking Act and Roosevelt used it to create the Federal Deposit Insurance when the banks reopened. That Sunday night, on the eve of the end of the bank holiday, Roosevelt spoke to a radio audience of more than 60 million people. And he told them in very clear language, quote, what has been done in the last few days, why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be." End of quote. And this result was a remarkable turnaround in the public's uh, confidence. Well, since this almost iconic banking crisis of 1933, we've seen financial crisis in various shapes and sizes throughout the world. And now the COVID crisis poses yet a new challenge to the financial system. So how has the financial system stood up against this latest test? And what can we learn from it for the future? These are the questions that I want to address with you uh, today. First, what I will try to reintroduce is the concept of uh, systemic risk. And I will argue that this has been the primary ingredient in financial crises throughout history, from 1933 to the 2000, 2008 global financial crisis. I will then discuss what governments and regulators have done to strengthen the financial system. I will explain how the financial reforms of the past 10 years helped to cushion the impact of the COVID crisis, especially in the banking sector, but that systemic risk revealed itself in other parts of the financial system. And I will end by discussing how we can address these new vulnerabilities in the financial system and strengthen its overall resilience. 
Well, I know you're also quite interested in the current economic outlook for, uh, for Europe. So I agreed with Susan uh, that we would cover that part in the uh, Q&A. So I can assure you that there will be plenty of time for that important issue too. But let me start with uh, the issue of systemic risk. Systemic risk, it can be described in, in many methods, for instance, uh, as the risk that an initial shock may spread through the system to such an extent that otherwise healthy and solvent financial firms and markets are severely affected. It can even lead to the breakdown of an entire financial system, severe economic disruption and great economic hardship for companies and households. The financial system is more vulnerable to systemic risk than other sectors of the economy. And academic literature gives three main reasons for this. First, many financial institutions are characterized by a liquidity mismatch between assets and liabilities. For example, banks traditionally take deposits that can be withdrawn at very short notice, and they provide long-term loans to companies. If for some reason, depositors want to withdraw their money all at the same time, the bank does not have sufficient reserves to pay out there. So the stability of the financial system is highly dependent on confidence. In case of banks, it is the confidence of depositors in the value of the loan book, and confidence that other depositors will not withdraw their money. Importantly, this type of dynamic is not exclusive to banks, as we will see later on. Secondly, participants in financial markets are interconnected by a complex network of dependencies and exposures. Interconnectedness is inherent in any mature financial system. It allows financing to flow, and it provides for diversification and risk sharing. Yet imbalances or shocks in one sector can quickly pass through to the rest of the financial system. The third factor that makes the financial sector particularly susceptible to systemic risk is the intertemporal nature of financial contracts. For example, if you invest in a company stock, you have expectations about the cash flows that that stock will generate in the future. Expectations that may or may not materialize. Changes in expectations about future cash flows can lead to sudden asset price fluctuations, like stock market crashes, resulting in financial loss. If you combine that with leverage, the consequences may become unpleasant. Liquidity mismatch, uh, interconnectedness, uh, and the intertemporal nature of financial contracts, these three elements make the financial system more vulnerable to systemic risk than other sectors in the economy. We saw the first element at work during the 1933 banking crisis. A collapse in confidence in the banks, combined with expectations about the behavior of other depositors, led to a run on the banking system. The image, the image of people queuing up in front of their banks, hoping to collect their savings, lives on forever, even in movies. Eh? Who can forget the American Christmas classic it's a wonderful life when Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed use their honeymoon savings to keep the bank open. We've seen the three elements of systemic risk at work many times since then. For example, during the Asian crisis of 1997, the Russian default crisis of 1998, and of course, during the global financial crisis of 2008. Having been a witness to all these three crises in the course of my professional career, I must say that each one of them was a fresh eye-opener. Throughout history, financial policies have aimed to contain systemic risk and build resilience in the financial system. For example, after the financial crisis of 1907, the Federal Reserve was established to act as a lender of last resort. And after the banking crisis of the 1930s, we saw the birth of capital requirements and deposit insurance in the US and elsewhere. The reforms after the 2008 global financial crisis can also be seen in the same historic context. Capital and liquidity requirements for banks were raised to increase their loss absorbing capacity and to withstand the outflow of funds. Capital requirements were raised even further for highly interconnected global banks. And counterparty credit risk was reduced by increasing margin and collateral requirements and by establishing central clearing counterparties. Despite this historic tradition, there was also something new about the post-2008 reforms. 
This time, the reforms were truly an international effort. The G20 member states established the Financial Stability Board that coordinated the development of new financial stability policies. The FSB was also given the task of monitoring the global financial system for new weaknesses and springing into action at short notice once a new crisis hit. Since modern financial markets do not stop at national borders, that was a very important step. We still reap the benefits from this today, and I will discuss this aspect later on. So we have identified the elements of systemic risk and how this has shaped financial crises and policy responses. Let's now look at how the financial system has weathered the COVID storm. First and foremost, the bold policy response by governments, central banks and supervisors helped maintain global financial stability and sustain the supply of credit to the real economy. Also, the global financial system, at least its core parts, is more resilient than it was 10 years ago. And this is largely due to the financial reforms in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis. Thanks to these reforms, banks have been able to absorb the COVID shock. They've continued to provide credit to the economy at a time in which this is most desperately needed. Although COVID-related corporate insolvencies will no doubt hit their loan books pretty hard, it seems banks will also be able to continue supplying credit in the near future. And I really want to emphasize this because I think it offers a very valuable lesson. Many of you probably recall the tough decisions, the tough discussions that we had only a few years ago about the cost of, of raising capital requirements for banks and the possible negative impact that that would have on credit supply. But if we had not done this, governments would now have to deal with a crippled banking sector in full deleveraging mode on top of an economy starved of credit. We would have had a crisis within the crisis. In other words, building resilience into the financial system in good times may seem expensive, but over the long run, it's the most cost effective thing to do. So the banking sector has withstood the COVID stress test pretty well. However, you and I know that not everything went smoothly in the financial system, as events in March last year show. Let's go over some of the key developments that happened. As countries went into their first lockdown and the scale of the COVID impact became apparent, investors and corporates fled for safety and liquidity. You probably remember how firms everywhere tried to tap the capital markets. Money market funds experienced significant outflows and some open-ended funds faced large redemptions. Initially, yields on risk-free assets fell rapidly at the end of February and early March due to the flight to safety. However, this became an abrupt and disruptive dash for cash in mid-March as investors' demand for cash and near-cash assets rose sharply. And this resulted in selling pressure on usually safe and liquid assets, such as government bonds. Risk-free yields began to rise sharply and the financing conditions facing major economies significantly tightened. Looking at a Bloomberg screen during that period sometimes felt like being back in September, 2008. Central banks had to take extraordinary measures to stabilize markets. Asset purchases, liquidity operations, and backstop facilities for specific financial entities. While in 2008, central banks had to bail out the banks, this time they had to bail out a number of financial markets. And some of this may have been inevitable given the enormity of the economic shock. But weaknesses in the non-banking part of the financial system made matters worse. The FSB carried out a thorough review of the March market turmoil it was published last November, and I recommend you take a close look at it. As the review showed, liquidity mismatch, interconnectedness, and sudden changes in expectations, those systemic risk factors that I mentioned earlier, again played a key role in propagating the initial shock. It seems that over time, investment in money market funds and open-ended funds came to be seen by investors as just as liquid 
and safe as cash. But as doubts started to grow about the ability of these funds to liquidate their assets on demand, investors wanted to be at the front of the redemption queue. In other words, as it emerged that these funds had a liquidity mismatch without the buffers to sustain it, a stampede was triggered that was in essence not so different from the classic bank runs that we saw in the 1930s. Next, the March events highlighted the dependence of the system on readily available liquidity. If liquidity strains emerge in money market funds and open-ended funds through margin calls in core bond markets, vulnerabilities spread quickly through the financial system. And one of the important post-crisis reforms that I mentioned earlier was the greater use of margining and central clearing through CCPs. Thanks to this, the market stress did not result in widespread concerns about counterparty risks like we did see in 2008. But violent price swings in financial markets translated into margin calls that may have been larger than expected. And this put sharp liquidity pressure on those on the wrong side of derivatives exposures, adding to the demand for liquidity in the system. All of this should not surprise us. Money market funds already played a crucial role in propagating the initial shock of Lehman's collapse in 2008. Maybe you remember the speech that Paul Volcker gave at a NABE conference in 2013 when accepting the Lifetime Achievement Award for economic policy. On that occasion, he already expressed his concern about the weaknesses in the regulation of money market funds. With the financial reform agenda after 2008 being heavily focused on banks and much less so on non-banks, vulnerabilities in the financial sector moved from the banking sector to the non-bank financial sector. And this is what I call the waterbed effect. Pressing down on one end of the financial system will cause risks to pop up elsewhere. And indeed, since 2008, non-bank financial intermediation, or in short, NBFI, has grown much faster than bank intermediation. It now accounts for about half of all financial assets worldwide. So whereas in the aftermath of the previous crisis, the emphasis was very much on the banks, we now have some catching up to do when it comes to reducing systemic risk in non-bank financial markets. Where there is a liquidity mismatch, a complex network of exposures and potentially sudden price swings, it is key that we have buffers, that we have flexibility in regulation and safety valves in the system to contain systemic risk. Financial institutions need buffers to absorb losses and liquidity shocks. Regulation needs flexibility in order to allow institutions to use these buffers. And the system needs safety valves, like margining, to prevent too much risk pressure being built up. In July, the Financial Stability Board will publish a consultation report with proposals to improve the resilience of money market funds. And this work will also consider the relationship between these funds and short-term funding markets. We need to look in particular at whether investors conceive money market funds as equivalent to deposit accounts. And if so, whether money market funds have the resilience to meet the consequent liquidity demands in the event of severe stress. This work will soon be followed by ongoing efforts focused on other open-ended funds margining and bond market structure and liquidity. The FSB also continues to advance work to improve CCP resilience and resolvability. Maintaining a strong global financial system requires a global approach. And here we have one big advantage. We can actually fall back on a framework of international cooperation that has been tested and proven to work. The Financial Stability Board has coordinated important financial reforms in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Indeed, coordinating the post-COVID reform agenda to rebuild financial resilience will be central to it, its work well into next year. Ladies and gentlemen, almost 90 years have passed since that American president with Dutch ancestral roots first took the airwaves to reassure the public. Yet today, the challenge to contain systemic risk and to keep the financial system resilient 
is as important as ever. The policy tools that we have at our disposal are now much more powerful. But the complexity and the dyna dynamism of the financial sector are also far greater. It's a job that's never done. So let us make use of the architecture for international cooperation that we've built up and ensure the post-pandemic financial system is resilient and stays strong enough to meet future challenges as well. I thank you for your attention. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, President Kanat. You've given us reasons for hope and uh, feeling quite good about the, the recovery in the world economy. I want to start with um, two questions on financial stability and then move into the outlook for the Eurozone. Um, for our audience, I know we have a lot of people here, please post your questions, not in the chat function, but in the Q&A section. Only uh, the speaker and myself will be able to see questions, um, so they will be anonymous, but please enter. So let's start with first the issue of low interest rates. Um, for most of the last 11 year we've had, years, we've had extraordinarily low and even negative policy rates. Um, there are many fears that asset bubbles are building up in various corners of the financial system, whether it's technology, stocks, or Bitcoin and Dogecoin, or real estate prices. Um, What's your view on this? What can we be doing? And what can the FSB and other um, national regulators be doing to try to mitigate potentially very large asset bubbles from developing and bursting? Yeah, well, uh, this is, of course, a question that preoccupies many of us. Um, I mean, the, the current low level of interest rates is largely driven by uh, secular declines that have taken place in, uh, in uh, so-called R-star, equilibrium uh, real interest rate. And uh, these low interest rates have proven to be necessary for central banks to, to meet their mandates in terms of their inflation objectives, inflation aims, uh, etc. But in a low for long environment, we know uh, that there are vulnerabilities building up in the financial sector and that we have to uh, sort of guard ourselves also against them. In the first instance, that relates, of course, to monitoring. Um, then it also relates to applying macro prudential tools. Uh, mm -hmm. That is an area that is also still very much uh, under development. And we know that the range of macro prudential tools, even though it's a promising avenue, I would say, to, uh, to explore further, but that it is far from perfect in terms of uh, being capable to fully contain systemic risks. If you try uh, to separate the buildup of systemic risks versus the buildup of, of resilience within financial institutions in order to be able to absorb uh, these uh, vulnerabilities, then roughly speaking, uh, the macro prudential instruments we have are all almost all focused at sort of increasing the resilience at the financial institutions but we have very little tools at our availability to also uh, uh, prevent the buildup of such financial imbalances in, in, into, the, uh, into the financial system. Now, in and of itself, increasing asset prices, housing prices, which is an issue, at least in my country, it probably also is in the US, is not a concern as long as you do not observe excessive leverage against these price increases taking place. And yes, recently, there have been a couple of examples again where uh, some of the lessons that I would have hoped that had been learned uh, after the 2008 global financial crisis appear not to have been learned. And I think there is still a lot to be gained in terms of more disclosures, better understanding exposures, better capabilities of adding up exposures, charts, interconnectedness, et cetera, in the system. And that is also where I see a role for, for the uh, Financial Stability Board um, because uh, ultimately these global of these financial imbalances tend to have a global imprint uh, as well. Great. Well, we've got um, questions coming in, so I'm going to keep this very short. Um, but would love for you to say a few words on what is the ECB's view or your own view on the eurozone GDP recovery this year and next year? What are some of the downside risks you're watching, and what are going to be the key drivers of the recovery? Well, I, I think in short, I would say that the ground on which the recovery uh, will be built is getting firmer and firmer as we advance uh, in time. If you look at the various sectors in the economy, 
I think the manufacturing industry in the euro area has been doing fine, uh, is at peak level and has been at peak levels already for quite some time. Global trade has more or less fully recovered to the pre-corona levels. The only uh, part of the economy where there were clearly uh, what, where, where, where it was clearly fallen short was the services sector, but that's fully explainable because parts of the service sector were, of course, uh, put into lockdown and the containment measures in place in the various countries prohibited uh, many of the consumers to consume the services uh, that we were talking about. Now, luckily, what we are seeing in the high frequency data over the last two months, uh, April and March, the service sector is now also catching up in the uh, euro area. And this should be unsurprising because this is a similar pattern as we also observed in jurisdictions in countries that were a little bit farther advanced than we were in terms of vaccinations and inoculations like the US, uh, Israel, the UK, uh, et cetera. And in that sense, I think we can take comfort that the euro area in the coming months will take the exact same trajectory Services will also uh, pick up. We expect uh, more than 4% growth over the full year. Uh, the balance of risk, uh, the, the downside risks that were predominantly related to the pandemic will gradually fade as also our population uh, will get vaccinated up to let's say the 70% or so that we roughly uh, need to, uh, to, to lift the various uh, restrictions. And I would argue that there is still significant upside risk, actually, and that has to do with pent up demand. Traditionally, we have been very conservative within the ECB, assuming in our baseline projections that the savings rate would just return to its pre-corona level, but there would be no sort of pent up demand taking place. I personally think that's a, a, a bit of an overly conservative assumption. I would think that since, well, for instance, in my country, some 70% of the excess saving has been forced saving, involuntary saving. So I think it's rational to assume, even if small part of that, that it will actually be used and that will then provide a significant upward risk uh, to the outlook. So all in all, I think the outlook is, uh, is quite bright and is brighter and as it has been for a long, long time. Good, we're getting lots of questions on financial system risk. Uh, I'm gonna start with one. Can you please comment on how the FSB and ECB are integrating climate change risks, stress tests, and scenario planning exercises into the policy framework and architecture? Well, that's a very interesting question, I think. And it's also an answer that is, uh, that is multifaceted because I think climate change will affect the works of central banks, financial stability authorities, supervisory authorities in many, many, many uh, dimensions. Uh, first of all, of course, if we don't manage the energy transition well, then we will have shockwise adjustments, which will also affect our price stability, uh, the inflation outlook, and therefore our price stability mandate. In terms of our operations, our monetary policy operations, of course, climate-related risk will also start to affect counterparty credit risk, uh, collateral risk, and the like. So in our own risk management, we will have to guard against uh, such risks uh, going forward. But what I would argue perhaps is the most important uh, thing to do for central banks and supervisors alike is to make sure that in regulating the financial system that it provides the appropriate incentives also for the financial system to facilitate the uh, energy transition as much as possible. Let us not fool ourselves. The most important tool to achieve what we want to achieve is appropriate pricing of carbon emissions, etc. That's a public policy tool that is firmly in the hands of the government. So climate related policy, in my view, in the first instance, it's government policies. But I do think that central banks have the tools and the means to support that, that, uh, that policies in their own operations and in overseeing the financial sector, which you could regard as the brains of the body uh, that sort of direct the flow of credit and the, and the flow of capital through the economy. And that flow needs to change. That needs to be redirected into a more green and a less brown uh, direction. Great, I mean, some of our research at MGI has shown that in some coastal areas, real estate prices are undervalued by probably 30 to 50% because they're not taking into account rising sea levels and increased flooding risks. So eventually those risks and repricing of assets are gonna have to um, happen. Going on to another question, um, your comment about money market 
um, funds are very interesting. Do you propose an, a deposit insurance system or some other safety net to prevent runs in future crises? Aren't the balances in these funds safer due to the due to the diversification of underlying holdings? Yeah, well, to me, that seems a little bit like push, putting uh, the issue. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, uh, or approaching the issue from the wrong end. I mean, the money market funds themselves have been a source of turbulence. So I do believe, rather than providing a sort of safety net in terms of a, a deposit-like insurance uh, scheme, I think the, fo uh, the efforts should be focused at uh, reinforcing the resilience of money market funds themselves so that they can cope with the uh, liquidity mismatches that they have the policies in place uh, to, to better match the redemptions on the asset profile uh, that they have. Uh, and that's where the focus should lie instead of uh, providing public insurance for those uh, those who uh, redeem or those who, who submit their money to the uh, money market funds. If you want to have deposit insurance, then you should put your money uh, into a bank. If you want to do bank like things, fine, but then you should ask for a bank license and then you should also enjoy bank regulation and uh, all the uh, all the niceties that are related to that. Great. Um, we have another question. What impact do you think modern monetary theory will have on financial instability in the future as some fiscal policymakers adopt this viewpoint? And of course, um, given all the fiscal stimulus we saw over the last year, government debt levels, of course, have surged um, and are, are higher than ever. Well, I, I guess, I mean, we are living in a world with uh, protracted low interest rates. And also going forward, and given uh, the factors that are behind this decline in our star, with many of which are quite structural, and of course they're not secular, so at some point uh, they might reverse, but I don't see a reversal on the horizon very quickly. It means uh, in that outlook, it is, in a, uh, it is undisputable that an, an issue like debt sustainability uh, can be met at higher debt levels in the future, than was the case in the past when we had, had uh, higher, uh, higher interest rates. So that is, I think, a general rule. There is no uh, denying. Modern monetary theory sort of takes this simple observation and true observation into the extreme that sort of public debt would not matter at all anymore uh, and that therefore you can sort of issue as much debt as uh, possible. That is clearly not something that I would uh, subscribe to. If it was applied by fiscal policymakers, uh, it, in my view, would be a source of serious uh, instability, potential instability. And that's why also I think central banks should guard themselves against the risks of fiscal dominance in such a scenario. Now, let me be very clear about it. I don't believe that where we are today, that fiscal dominance is a serious risk. If it were to be the case, then we would see much more disruptive run-ups in inflation expectations than the ones that we are seeing. I mean, of course, I welcome eh, higher inflation expectations as we saw today in the markets eh, for the euro area because we've been trying to push up inflation expectations already for a long period of time. But if you talk about eh, modern monetary theory and the kind of disruptions that that might uh, create, then of course we're talking about a completely different type of inflation expectations. And I think eh, we should make sure that this is not the way to go. Right. Um, okay, let's move on to some counterparty risk. There are a couple questions uh, related to recent events. So one is, given the recent meltdown of Archegos Capital Management, what policy changes would you like to see implemented addressing hedge funds and family offices and the counterparty risks they create? And let me add the lack of transparency around the leverage that was involved in, the, in that instance. Well, the nice thing about this question is that the answer is already uh, embedded in the question. I think, uh, um, as, as I think many of us have also been able to read in the, in the Federal Reserve's financial stability report that was, I think, published last week, there is an issue about the lack of transparency about uh, the exposures that such hedge funds and family businesses uh, at this moment uh, enjoy. They are in a, a special position. Well, and that has made it possible that the banks had serious uh, exposures on them without uh, knowing of the exposures that the other banks had. 
And that led to this situation, which I think is clearly undesirable. So I think we need to fix that flaw in, uh, in, in regulation and make sure that if there are hedge funds and family offices taking on these kinds of exposures from multiple banks at the same time, uh, where leverage can add up quite significantly, well, then, of course, that should be accompanied with appropriate disclosure requirements, supervisory reporting and supervisory oversight in order to avoid such accidents from happening again. Great. There's a related question uh, focusing on equity markets, mentioning how small groups of investors can influence equity prices. Uh, using the Archegos collapse, but also um, the rise of retail investors uh, driving prices, for instance, the GameStop Reddit uh, frenzy that occurred in the market and the fact that we now have the gamification of retail investing. Um, what kind of financial uh, risk or potential instability does that create? It's interesting uh, that we're talking about uh, an ever longer list of such sort of examples of uh, uh, hiccups, let me put it like that, that individually seem to be uh, uh, cases that you can discuss one by the other. But I think the underlying trend is, uh, is, is, is testimony of the fact that financial stability risks are actually uh, building up in, uh, in this environment of, uh, of, of low for long. And the example you mentioned on retail investors uh, is, is, I think, yet another example of, an, of a sort of aberration in, uh, in financial markets. This was, of course, a novelty. It surprised uh, their counterparties very much, and significant losses were uh, incurred by the hedge fund industry on the other side of, the, of this trade. I, I just would think uh, that uh, next time around, it will not be as easy uh, to replicate this, uh, this kind of, uh, well, I would almost say surprise yeah, surprise action uh, in the markets because, of course, yeah, uh, other market participants will learn, they will guard themselves. And in general, uh, where there is a competition between retail investors and sort of big wholesale investors, history has more often than not uh, not been on the side of the retail investor. Um, even yeah, if it is this time, it was pretty much uh, organized. But if there is too much uh, organization there, then of course, you can also enter into, uh, into issues of market manipulation, uh, et cetera. So I don't think at all that this is a very good uh, development. And it shows how vigilant uh, also we as central bankers have to be in this uh, low for long uh, interest rate environment. Great. Uh, there's a question here around counterparty risk. Um, stress tests and counterparty risk are typically bilateral, one party to another. But what about cumulative counterparty risk? Um, that banks or other institutions may face. How should we think about that, measure it, and are there policy measures to uh, prevent excessive cumulative party counterparty risk? Well, of course, one way to best uh, uh, try to contain the risks here is to provide incentives for central, uh, central clearing of counterparty exposures, uh, et cetera, and make uh, bilateral uh, exposures less attractive uh, than, uh, than having a centrally cleared uh, exposure. But other than that, I would say yeah, the modeling techniques, the risk management techniques that are uh, in this area are not fundamentally different from uh, other credits uh, in the sense that you, you want to see, uh, well, not only adequate historical data, but I think uh, stress testing and scenario analysis, think the unthinkable, uh, severe but plausible, scenarios, even if they have not happened in the recent past. But well, we know that financial history doesn't always uh, repeat itself in exact the same form and that new shocks always arrive from, uh, from different angles. So a combination of historical uh, uh, data modeling and more forward looking uh, stress testing, I think is the, is the technique to go forward. Great. Um, I would like to, we, we have a, a little bit more time if there are more questions from the audience, but I want to go back to the Eurozone outlook. So we know that that performance within the Eurozone, of course, has been highly varied over the last decade and coming into the recovery, it looks like there are significant differences, again, between how a country like Germany is performing in the Netherlands uh, versus other economies in, for instance, um, the South or the East. So as you think about monetary policy, 
uh, and the future of you know moving away from bond purchases, maybe tightening up policy rate. How um, how do you think that the ECB will or should think about the variations in economic performance across the eurozone, and and how can individual countries um, you know respond to the fact that the rate's going to be set for the eurozone as a whole? Yeah, the thing is that, of course, the ECB is the central bank of the euro area as a whole, and we only have one monetary policy, uh, and there is not much we can do about structural divergences. I think the policies uh, to counter structural divergences are fiscal and structural policies. And also on that front, I would say there is uh, comforting news in the fact that we have, uh, going into the recovery, we have now the next generation EU recovery fund, which is exactly meant to address this type of weakness eh, that is inherent to the, uh, to the euro area. It's a very potent instrument that tries to combine public investment with structural reforms, which I think is the way to raise the uh, productivity performance and also potential growth in some of the more vulnerable uh, economies of the euro area. And that's what we need. I mean, we will get out of this corona crisis with elevated debt levels, elevated corporate debt, elevated public debt. I mean, that's a given. So the only way to get out of this in a decent manner is that we actually increase the growth potential of our economies. And in that sense, I think it's quite promising that we have this next generation EU recovery funds. It's an other source of upward risk. We talked about upward risks uh, to the outlook. And it's also an additional factor uh, that should allow us to gradually wind down our uh, emergency support, which is nothing else than rotating away from emergency support to, let's say, uh, the other unconventional monetary policies that the ECB will still have in place also after winding down the PEP. This, uh, to a US audience, this is a very important difference where the Fed policy and ECB policies are not comparable. Uh, if the Fed is to temper, to taper its asset purchases, it will essentially be done with unconventional policy support. That's not the case in the euro area. The only thing we are talking about is rotation from emergency support to other forms of unconventional support. We will still have the old asset purchase program. We will still have the negative interest rates in place. And most importantly, the targeted longer term refinancing operations to the banks. In a bank dominated financial sector in Europe, this is hugely important. And just to get a feel for the sheer magnitude, the total Teltro exposure of the euro system is 18.18% of euro area GDP. That would be roughly half the Fed's balance sheet uh, in, in comparable terms. So that is a main difference that I think is important. And this next generation EU recovery fund should be another factor that should allow us to, uh, to gradually, uh, gradually wind down the emergency asset purchases as the emergency is clearly coming to an end once we will go into 2022. That's great. Last question, we have to ask it, we're economists, maybe you wanna give some forward guidance on when do you foresee the, the low interest rate environment or let's just say the very accommodative monetary policy uh, that we're currently in starting to change and shift and, and end? Well, that will, of course, entirely uh, depend on the inflation outlook. Uh, most of the central banks have cl quite a clear mandate. Inflation is going up, as a matter of fact, on both sides of the uh, Atlantic. But there are clearly some temporary factors uh, behind it. And in order uh, for this temporary uh, increase in inflation that we will see in the remainder of the year, both in Europe and in the US, in order for it to become more sustained, of course, the critical question is what will wages do? Uh, will labor market shortages that did exist in various places, both in the US, but also in some individual member states of the euro area, like the country that I know best, if these labor shortages will resurface, then of course you will see, uh, you will start to see wage growth. And that should then translate into, into a more sustained rise in inflation toward our uh, objectives. Now, for the euro area, I must say that I don't see that major push in wages yet. I think wage growth uh, is still likely uh, going to be quite moderate, also going into uh, 2022. 
So in that environment, uh, I don't see a case for uh, a, a fundamentally different inflation outlook, maybe a little bit better than we thought previously, but not uh, up to a point where you would see a fundamental, a fundamentally different uh, interest rate environment. Uh, that, that we will have to be very, very patient uh, before such an environment would occur. For the US, maybe it's a little bit of a different uh, situation that might go a little bit different faster. But well, let me focus uh, uh, my comments mostly on, on the region that I know uh, best. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, you've covered uh, such a broad range of topics, really interesting insights. Um, on behalf of the audience and the National Association of Business Economics, let me thank you for joining us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much.